I had a nightmare last night. What about? Well, it's a nightmare I get all the time when I'm stressed. I dream I'm being attacked by a swarm of stinging bees. They're everywhere. And then I wake up. That's awful. <laughs> I know you're afraid of bees. I remember that story you did on bees when you were still in public radio. Oh, do you? The one about the fate of the bees during the last drought? I followed some beekeepers around checking their hives and had to put on the white beekeeper suit. Here's what they told me about bees. And, and you should have a healthy respect for them, but uh, I don't think you need to be scared of them. Okay. Uh, I'll try. You may get some buzzing around the outside. Just, that close? Yeah, yeah. Don't if they do, don't don't go swatting and worry. And the more you swat, the they give off a smell that will attract others. Okay, we gotta zip this up just so your cord can stick out. All right. Okay, you want gloves on too, probably. Probably. That gonna work? That'll work. Okay. Let's hope it works. Okay. Or, or I'm blaming you. <laughs> Kat, you can just tell I'm scared to death, even though I'm all suited up. But here's the thing that they forgot to tell me about honeybees. They're attracted to dark colors. Okay, but you were all set up in the white beekeeper suit, right? Theoretically. We're done at this location. We'll hop in. See, the, these, the bees are scattered up and down the orchard. It made a really loud Okay, I'll screen. tell you what. Why? That's why. Likes the microphone. <laughs> it's the color. They don't like dark, dark colors. colors yeah. yeah. You're just you're reaching your hand on the bees. Yeah. He doesn't wear gloves. I mean, crazy. <laughs> You've even got one on you. How do you like that? Look at that. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> okay. Oops. There's another one on. Uh, oh my god. Yeah, they just kept swarming my microphone, and of course, I had headphones on too, so it sounded like they were inside my ears. Go again on my microphone. Okay. Maybe I should just take pictures at this point. <laughs> hey, I think I'm chickening out the mm -hmm. microphone. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't run, right? Don't swat. Don't swat. <laughs> you want to stick that microphone right down there close and get good sound? No, really. <laughs> oh wow, look at that. <laughs> 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 oh, Amy, you were so brave to battle the bees, your biggest fear. All for a story. Right? God, I can still hear those bees in my nightmares. Okay, but pollinators are important even if they do have a nasty sting. Yeah, I learned a lot from that beekeeper. You know, we also have our own stinging insect expert here at UC Davis, entomologist Lynn Kimsey, the director of the Bohart Museum of Entomology. And she told me about the Schmidt Sting Pain Index. Have you heard about this? No, but it doesn't sound good. Yeah, the Schmidt Index ranks the pain from insect stings. And she says it's pretty accurate. I've probably been stung by almost everything on his list. <laughs> Yay! What's the most painful? It's it's a toss up between bullet ants, these big South American ants, and um, tarantula hawks. Whoa! What are tarantula hawks? They're big wasps. Oh, <laughs> and I imagine they prey on tarantulas. Yes, and apparently Lynn was also stung by one while working in the desert collecting flying insects. She says the tarantula wasp has a quarter of an inch long stinger cap. A quarter of an inch long. And of course, as I'm putting it into the kill jar, it got me right underneath the thumbnail. And so I'm hopping up and down doing little four-letter phrases and words and things. and Because and, it, it really feels like you put your finger in an electrical outlet. But it only lasted about 20 seconds. <laughs> oh, that's all. <laughs> oh, my God. Why is she telling you this story? I mean, does she know you are afraid of honeybees? Not to mention a tarantula hawk. Right? Well, here's what she said when I told her that. Unlike the tarantula hawk, honeybees, the only reason for having venom is to make you hurt. You know, it's to protect their nests, all right? So it's designed to hurt vertebrates 
mammals like us as much as possible for as long as possible. Whereas with tarantula hawks, yeah, they use it defensively, but mostly it's to capture tarantulas. So yeah, it hurts briefly, but. All right. <laughs> now that I'm going to have nightmares. Oh, God. <laughs> 90% of the animals on Earth are insects, so you got to get over it. <laughs> yeah, Amy, get over it. <laughs> no, I like honeybees. I actually really like bugs. I mean, maybe not the stinging ones, but I like honeybees. I like butterflies. I love fireflies. I like all the different types of beetles there are in the world. Like, insects are such interesting and curious creatures. And they're important in helping us understand our world a little better, as you'll soon see. I found out that Lynn Kimsey is full of fun insect stories. One time, she even had cockroaches for dessert. On, on purpose? Cockroaches for dessert? You'll find out. We're going to explore the world of insects in this episode of Unfold that we're calling Cockroaches for Dessert. Coming to you from UC Davis, this is Unfold, a podcast that breaks down complicated problems and unfolds curiosity-driven research. I'm Amy Quinton. And I'm Kat Curlin. So I imagine you've been to the Bohart Museum of Entomology like a thousand times. A few. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> well, I had only been there once and very briefly, so decided to go back. It's also the 75th anniversary of the Bohart. Oh, cool. I did not know that. I do know that they have a huge collection of insects, like millions. I think they have like more than 8 million specimens. Yeah, and they're from all over the world, from every single continent except Antarctica. Lynn says they have the seventh largest insect collection in North America and add about 30,000 new specimens a year. So, ready for a tour? Ready. Let's see. You might think, like I did, that a museum that holds more than 8 million insects would be huge. But you'd be wrong. It doesn't seem much bigger than a large classroom, but it's full of towering cabinets. And what I'm doing is I'm cranking open the compactor range where we have the pin specimens stored. I'll do a little more. Okay, so I'm moving about a ton of steel with my hand. (laughs) You're pretty powerful. And... What this consists of is these mobile shelving units that carry glass top wooden drawers that house the pin specimens. And there are 28 of these in each column in this mobile shelving system. She pulls out one of these specimen drawers. They can hold anywhere from 10 to 500 insects. In this drawer, there are about a dozen giant butterflies. They do have metallic blue on them. They're about the size of your hand if you spread your fingers, you know. The awesome thing about them, though, is when you look at, so the top is metallic, the bottom looks like an owl. And so when you look at them, they have these huge eye spots on the hind wings that look just like an unblinking owl staring at you. Oh, they do. Right? (laughs) See? And this is how they protect themselves. So these are called owl moths or caligo butterflies. They're really butterflies. Lynn says birds won't eat these guys. Eye spots are pretty effective on birds. They, they don't mess around with things with big eyes because they could become dinner, you know? <laughs> yeah, so those are pretty cool. And uh, these guys that, it, again, like the owl moth butterflies, bright colors on the top, but when they have the wings folded up, they look like a dead leaf. They're brown, speckled brown, little chew marks, leaf veins, the whole works, even to the point where they have tails that look like the petiole on a leaf. And they actually will roll over on their side with the wings closed, so they really do look like a dead leaf on the ground. It's very funny. It's beautiful. <laughs> so these guys are awesome. Yeah, they're, they're really great. Lynn's love for insects began when she was given a butterfly net as a child, but her love for butterflies drifted away, replaced by her love for scary stinging insects, including the infamous murder hornets. (laughs) I'm the queen of murder hornets, you know that, right? (laughs) 
<laughs> murder hornets, in case you don't know, are two-inch long invasive Asian hornets that can wipe out honeybees by usually decapitating them and feeding their thoraxes to their young. They're also capable of killing humans. While they've been found in northern Washington and eradicated, they are not in California. From my standpoint, it would be awesome to have them here. I, no one else would feel that way, but, it, but environmentally, they probably can't live in California because the summers are too dry. If you look at the distribution maps of their native ranges in South and Central Asia, it's all places with summer rain. So, wah, no, no murder hornets. <laughs> That's fine with me. Lynn says every year she discovers things about insects that are just plain weird. Take the murder hornet. Well, it turns out that at least one of the species of those hornets is photosynthetic. You know, we think of plants or bacteria as being the only things that can capture sunlight and turn it into stuff. <laughs> These wasps, they have yellow bands on the abdomen, which apparently act like solar panels. And they can use it to heat themselves up and generate energy and, yeah. Yeah, murder hornets are scary. And speaking of murder, Lynn once helped prosecutors convict a murderer just by identifying bugs on a car. So they wanted to know if the insects on the radiator could tell us where the car had been. And it turned out we could based in large part by having this collection available for comparison, right? So we could know where those species we found were occurred in, in the natural world. Lynn's testimony at trial that some of the bugs were from the Western U.S. helped convince jurors that the accused murderer, Vincent Brothers, lied about where he was at the time of the murder. He was convicted on five counts of first-degree murder for killing his wife, three kids, and mother-in-law. Insects in the Bohart collection can help scientists uncover lots of mysteries. DNA from bugs here can reveal what California landscapes were like in the early 1900s. For example, we have a lot of specimens that were collected from a town called Samuel Springs, which is in Napa County. Well, Samuel Springs is now under 50 feet of water in Lake Berryessa. But we can look at the specimens and tell you what that habitat was like, what kind of plants were there because of the pollinators, what kind of soils, and so on. So it really is an image in time and space in here. There are so many different kinds of insects in Bohart. I asked Lynn to show me her favorite. My favorites. Okay, we'll have to go down here. Let's see. She walks down the aisle to show me what she absolutely goes cuckoo over. These are called cuckoo wasps, and they're nest parasites of other wasps and bees, basically. So this one, for example, attacks um, wasps and bees that make large mud nests like mud daubers do, and these guys are, are parasites on those. It might sound strange to love a parasite until you get a close look at them. They glow with brilliant colors, including Lynn's favorite. Metallic blue. Yeah, oh yeah, I'm, I'm a total sucker for it. Metallic colors. <laughs> so the whole, this whole family of about, oh, I forget how many species, maybe 10,000, is they're almost all metallic blue or green or even golden depending on where they're from. Beautiful iridescent colors are quite common in the insect world. So these would be scarab beetles, for example. Um, and here's, here's a group of bright green scarab beetles. These are commonly called fig beetles. Um, Those are pretty. A little bit. Yeah, they're quite handsome. Some of the scarab beetles look like emeralds. I must admit, I was becoming bedazzled by beetles. This is a, another gorgeous one that you find in the American tropics. It's a scarab. It's about marble sized, bright metallic, pinks, uh, blues to greens, um, and great big horn coming off the front of the head. And these ones like poo. <laughs> They're so pretty though, they could be jewelry. They look like jewels. They, they really truly do, they're, they're absolutely gorgeous. Then Lynn grabs a three inch long, aptly named jewel beetle. Euchroma gigas. This is the one from Latin America. That, it's just huge. And it's metallic green and pink, kind of, depending on the angle of the light. 
lest you think all insects are beautiful, let's move on to the less beautiful and likely the least liked, unless you are a hungry toad or a famished frog, and that's cockroaches. The bowheart has some live ones, which I did not know. Oh, look at these things. Yeah, so we have two, right now we have two different kinds of cockroaches. We have these huge cave roaches and then the hissing cockroaches. Um, those are smelly things, the cave roaches. The cave roaches are absolutely huge. Dozens of them scurry around in a large terrarium at the Bohart. They're right underneath the walking sticks and not too far from Coco McFluffin, the pet tarantula. Cave roaches look like your standard American cockroach on steroids. So they're about twice the size. They have really big wings, kind of pale tan colored with a dark patch in the middle. And they, they normally live in caves. They're kind of scavengers. So we actually brought this colony back from a cave in Panama. Unlike their neighbors, the hissing cockroaches of Madagascar that prefer to eat fruit, Lynn says the cave roaches crave protein. They like dog kibbles. They're really gross when they fly overhead at night because they sound like a little B-52 bomber going overhead. Lynn spent some time in Panama where she got her first taste of a cockroach. When I was working in Panama, um, they were at a field station run by the Smithsonian, and the cooks decided to make us a big treat because we hadn't had you know, any fancy food for a while. So they made oatmeal cookies with raisins, which is awesome, right out of the oven, you know? I took a big bite out of mine, and then I realized that the raisin that I'd just bitten in half and swallowed had legs. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> and, you know, cockroaches kind of taste the way they smell, that kind of, yeah. Funky. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so... I'm not a fan, I, I just say. <laughs> Lynn says it was completely unintentional. Cockroaches were not on the dessert menu. Oh my God, that is so gross. <laughs> so she didn't eat them on purpose. No, she told me no one eats cockroaches on purpose. Here's why. Apparently, they pee into their own fat in their bodies and store it there. It makes them taste <sighs> awful. Oh, that's so gross. Oh my gosh. And they're going to outlive all of us. Very likely. I imagine you could have told us a lot more stories about insects at the Bohart. It would take all day. But there was one more little moth I wanted to tell you about. Oh yeah? The Donald Trump moth. Have you heard about it? Oh yeah. So that's the one with the scales on its head that resembles Donald Trump's bad comb over. Am I right? Yeah. The Neopalpa Donald Trump eye. Lynn says the scales also give it a pouty look. It's also very tiny. Little bitty front legs, small genitalia. She called it unremarkable. But it was found in Southern California and it is a newly discovered species. You can say that again. <laughs> you can find out more about the Bohart Collection by visiting their webpage at bohart.ucdavis.edu. And you can find links and more episodes of Unfold at ucdavis.edu slash unfold. Thanks for listening. Unfold is a production of UC Davis. It's produced by Cody Drabble. Original music for Unfold comes from Damian Barrett and Curtis Jerome Haynes. Hey, if you like this podcast, check out UC Davis's other podcast, The Backdrop. It's a monthly interview program featuring conversations with UC Davis scholars and researchers working in the social sciences, humanities, arts, and culture. Hosted by public radio veteran Soterius Johnson, the conversations feature new work and expertise on a trending topic in the news. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts.